God wants to fill you and me so full of himself that wherever we go, we're more than able to deal with any circumstances we see. Not because we're special, not because we're talented, not because we're gifted, but because of the Holy Ghost that lives in us. It's the same power that said, let there be light and there was light. It moved upon the face of the deep. It's the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead on the first resurrection morning. It's the same power that blew down the main street of Jerusalem and filled 120 believers and sent them out on the street speaking in tongues and staggering under the power of the Holy Ghost and the church of Jesus Christ was born. That same power resides in the child of God. So you are not weak today unless you choose to be weak. Welcome to the Voice of Triumph with Roger R. Woodard, Senior Pastor of Family Worship Center located in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Pastor Woodard's ministry is reaching a hurting world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Now, from Kings Mountain, North Carolina, here is Pastor Roger R. Woodard. The noun word neediness is a state of being in want or poverty. You see, the operative word in that scripture verse is need. My God shall supply your need. There's in that verse the law of supply and demand. There's light because there's darkness. There's sweet because there's bitter. There's victory because of there's battles and their needs. Each derive their value from the other. And so here we are in a time where there is a supply because of need. I remember, and you've heard me tell of this, my, my old buddy that was, looks like, looked like Colonel Sanders, and everywhere he went, everybody would ooh and wow over him, and he was quite a character. And I heard him say many a time, he said, we've seen the time when the table was full, We've seen the time when the table was empty. And he said, we've seen the time when we didn't even have the table. And that's describing Margaret and me. Uh, but in all of that, and I'm, I, to be honest with you, I've been broke. And I've had a little money. I like having a little money better. You know, I just, but what I have found is God is faithful in all. I've had to pray gas in the car and we'd coast down hills and, and coast into the churchyard almost out of gas. And God would put gas in there enough for us to get to our preaching. You say, well, what do you, what, what do you, is that the way you operate? No, most of the time I have to go down to the gas station. But why do you think Jesus walked on the water? Why do you think he multiplied the loaves and the fishes? Why do you think we have those miracles in the body? So you and I can know that in the midst of our need, our God can take care of our need. And if we will try, I don't need to walk on the water, especially if I've got a good boat. And I don't normally have to put, have, pray for him to put gas in my car as long as I've got a little bit of money to go fill it up. But when I have to have that type of a miracle, I serve a God who does the those sorts of miracles when it has to be done. And if that were not true, I couldn't be here today. Were it not for him supplying need and being there in time and on time with everything I needed, I wouldn't be here today. But guess what? I are here. I, I, we were celebrating our wedding anniversary in Lake Tahoe. It just so happened George Foreman was training for his comeback. And I got my picture taken with him. He's in my office. And massive man. He is huge. And uh, they told him he was fighting a young fighter. He said, they were telling him, George, that young man will kill you. You'll never survive. Well, he, true, he got beat up some. But he went the entire fight. And they were interviewing him after the fight. And he had sunglasses on. He said, they told me that young man would kill me. But... Here I is. Some of you, the devil has fought you everywhere you turned. 
you came in here so heavy and you wondered sometimes, I have, where are you, God? Margaret has a saying. She said I, sometimes she wants to catch a sparrow and put it on her head because he said the sparrow wouldn't fall without him taking note of it. And, and sometimes you feel that far alienated and that far away, but his eye is on the sparrow. And you're worth more than the sparrows. You may have been buffeted. You may have been hit. You may have come in here with a medical condition. The medical people say they can't help you. You may have your marriage torn apart. He may have walked out on you and broke your heart. She may have walked out on you and, and broke your heart. You, you may have a rebellious child that refuses to line up with God's Word. There may be all kinds of things. You may be, have too much month at the end of your money. You brought those needs in here. You can lay them at the foot of the cross because we have a God who will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory my father sometimes God allows those needs to break us to mold us to grow us so we can understand his supply because hear me there's a lot of stuff being preached today. If you just have enough faith, you won't have any doubt. You won't have any sickness. You won't have any lack. You won't have If you just have enough faith, that's a lie. It doesn't matter who your favorite preacher preaches it. It's a lie. You won't find that kind of lifestyle out of any of the Bible characters. Every one of them had their faith tried to the max. Paul so much so, in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, he said, I despaired of life because we were pressed beyond measure. But in all of the things God's promised in Paul's first letter, never to allow us to be tempted above what we're able to bear, but he will, with the temptation, make a way for our escape. The victory life is not lived without challenges and without trouble. The victory life is lived in the midst of trouble and the midst of everything hell can throw at you and you still find the capacity even if you have to grit your teeth to reach deep down in your gut and say praise God he's good God he'll keep me he's been faithful that's the victory life and that's what impresses and not that we do it to be impressed to impress anybody I'm just talking about living the life. It's like I said last week when Paul was gathering the sticks, the snake was in the, the bundle of sticks. It was there all the time, but the heat made it bite. And then the pagans started looking at Paul like he was some kind of criminal and expected him to fall over dead when the poisonous snake bit him. But after they observed him for a while, they changed their mind. And they said, oh, you're a God. He's not, I'm just a spirit-filled preacher. That's all I am. But I want you to understand this. There are people watching you too. They're wanting to know if what you have is real. They've seen enough flakes. They've seen enough people who, who claim stuff, don't live it, don't have it, because you've got to have it to give it. When Peter looked down at the lame bed and said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I'll give you. You've got to have it. You've got to have it to give it. But if you have it, when you give it, you won't leave the lame man sitting there begging. They'll be getting up, running and leaping and praising God. And tomorrow they'll be a witness. Ladies and gentlemen, when hell throws everything at you and you still find the capacity to raise your hands and praise the Lord, they'll change their minds. Y'all got anywhere to go? We're not going to have church tonight. I want y'all to look around the room the next time folks start praising. The next time folks get on their feet and raise their hands and praise the Lord. Understand something. They're not doing that because they don't have trouble. They're not doing that because they're not in the middle of a storm. <laughs> There's... They're doing it because despite everything, they know God's good. And maybe, maybe he hasn't answered yet, but the answer's on the way. And yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because
because he's with me. Glory. You see, uh, our needs reveal the power of God. Reveal the victory of God. And it reveals our character as well. And our faith. I don't know if I'll get to finish this or not. But one thing we have to do is identify need from want. You see, I'm not telling you anything. This is simple stuff. From life to death, life presents us a series of needs. One Wednesday night, in our pastor at Arab, one of the little toe-headed kids got up and said, pray for us little people. We have a hard time. And touch my heart. You see, God cared about that little fellow. At that moment, he was probably facing the crisis of his life. And the adults might laugh at his problem, but to him, it was the crisis of his life. We got all age groups in here, from the very young teens, middle-aged, and, and a little more seasoned. And all through life, we're presented challenges and crises, different, varying in degrees of difficulty, but to you, when you're in it, at that moment, that crisis is the crisis of our life. And see, that's the reason you don't graduate beyond this. Long as you're in this life, Flesh and spirit will war. And I've heard people say, well, you've got to count the cost to serve God. Sure you do, but you don't just count it one time. You will be presented with circumstances where you'll have to count it again because the devil will up his ante to try to get you to give up and go on. Yeah, God came through before, but will God come through now? This is a different set of circumstances. I've never been here before. Well, you may not have, but he has. And he goes before. And old my old buddy, I understand he's had a stroke now or maybe point of death down in Louisiana, my brother. He said, hey. Hell can't hand you anything heaven can't help you handle. Got it? Revelation 3.17, Jesus says of the church that said, I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. Now watch it. I have need of nothing. But Jesus said, you don't even know. You're poverty stricken. You're rich, wretched. And as I said a moment ago, God doesn't want you with that attitude. He wants you totally dependent on the Lord. And every one of us in the room will not trust in God unless we're brought into a circumstance where we have to. As long as we can take a pain pill, see the right doctor, have the right procedure, get a raise. As long as we can feel like we can handle I have a brother that way, the one that you were praying with me about that just nearly died, cracked his skull, and he was gone. God touched him. I don't know if he has sense enough to realize it was God. Because before, any time he had asked me to pray, and we'd pray, and then he had come out thinking, boy, I worked that out. I'm just, I was real smart, and that's borderline being a fool. You have to identify need from want. How do I do that? Well, sometimes we have to give it time. Because we've got a bad case of the I wants and I want right now. And sometimes we need to give a supposed need time for it to work out. Secondly, we need to understand that an unanswered prayer is not always an eternal no. It may be not now, later. My kids were pretty good drivers. 
but I, I wasn't going to give them a car until they were old enough, mature enough to drive the car. And of course, if you're like most people, you feel like you can handle anything and you you feel like you can handle it right now, but as our loving Father knows, sometimes if He gives us some of the things we pray for, when we pray for them, they'll ruin us. Yeah? You remember the old country song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers? You know what that country song's about? The guy saw the girl that he prayed for, he set his affection on, he wanted her so bad, didn't get her. Years later, saw her, and he said, thank God for unanswered prayer. Go back to your high school reunion and look at that handsome hunk of humanity that used to sashay down, and you thought, oh, how I want him. And now he needs a wheelbarrow to get his belly in the room. And you know, oh, thank God. Thank God. I went with Margaret to her high school reunion. I better leave that alone. I, I couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it. Hey, we've aged pretty good, Sally. You look pretty good for an old grandma. Think I'll keep you. At least if you'll have me. And here's something that you're going to have to learn if you haven't already learned it. You've got to give God thanks. Even in the midst of your trouble. Now, there was a, a fellow who wrote a book, and I understand what he was saying, and I don't agree with it, however. Give, give thanks. Thank God for everything. Look, I can't thank God the transmission blew out of my car or my house burned down or my wife were to walk out and leave me or a child were to die. I can't thank God for it, but I can thank God in it. And if I don't learn to thank God in the middle of my trial, in the middle of my storm, then I'm not going to get my prayers answered. You cannot tie your faithfulness to God to anything but your love of God. This is very important stuff, I'm telling you. You say, well, I can't thank God in the middle of my storm. Can you thank God for the cross? Have you found the capacity to thank God for the cross? That awful picture that is so awful, you, even though the, the movie did a great job that uh, uh, Mel Gibson made, probably the best job of rendering it that's ever been done, and even then it wasn't gruesome enough. This gruesome thing that transpired because heaven loved you and me enough to send Jesus to take that beating and crucifixion so that we don't have to die and go to hell so we can be redeemed for the, the law of sin and death. He took that beating for us and as gruesome as it is and it may seem outlandish, I thank God he was willing to do it. The only way we could be saved. So in the midst, Margaret and I were singing at the funeral of our dear, dear, dear friend Norma Rayburn a few years ago who battled cancer for so long and her husband Bill was there he, most of you don't know him but he did preach here early on when we were in the old building good friend, my overseer racquetball opponent, we like to kill each other on the racquetball court and I'll never forget singing long and winding road keep on leading me up ahead I see a sign that points me straight ahead to victory I know I must be traveling right. For I remember passing Calvary. And though it's dusty and it's old for me, for years it's borne this traveler's load. Someday this road will turn to gold. And we sang that line. And for Norma, it's already turned to gold. And I saw that little hand up through a broken heart and tears, giving honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who's never failed me yet. Can you find the capacity when the world thinks you ought to get drunk, you ought to get high, you ought to walk away from your marriage and your kids buy a Harley and hit the road, 
turn your back on everything because you're going through the greatest hell you've ever gone through. But instead of doing that through your tears and a broken heart, you raise that hand in honor to his name. Not because you're feeling joy. You see, the world doesn't understand that. Their world is wrecked. Ours hangs together because Jesus is the glue. Yeah. Ah, uh, you Christians need a crutch. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. Jesus is my crutch. And he has been all my life. And guess what? I don't need a highball. I don't need a pill. And the mountain stands by me. When the Thank you, Holy Ghost. When the earth all around me is sinking sand. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I run to the rock. Thank God I know who to run to. Third thing, be persistent. Keep praying like the widow and the unjust judge. Keep coming back and understand what we don't obtain, we don't really need. Be assured of this, God meets needs. And I cut this message way down. I knew I'd never get there. I could have given you a book, chapter, verse to prove every point. The Bible's full of it. But I want to leave you with this. It's very important that what you and I persistently believe God for, when we have that answer, that that answered prayer does not become the fixation of our faithfulness. You, you may have prayed years. Abraham believed God for Isaac through all types of obstacles and when it was biologically impossible, here comes the miraculous answer. His heart is thrilled with joy for this boy. His whole hopes and dreams wrapped up in him. He'd had him now in the home long enough to get very, very attached and in love with his son. And then along comes God, put him on the altar, sacrifice him back to me. Now, wait a minute, God. I waited for this boy through years of impossibility. You finally gave him to me. Now, you want me to kill him just to show that I love you? That's right. I can't imagine that. But he gets the wood. He gets the fire. Brings his son along to go sacrifice. Dad, uh, here's the wood and here's the fire. Where's the sacrifice? God will provide him a sacrifice, son. In fact, God already had before the foundation of the world. And so he gets the boy on the wood and draws back. And let me tell you something. The boy's dead in Abraham's mind. But you read in the New Testament that his faith was so strong that he believed that God, to keep his promise, would raise him from the dead if he didn't falter. <laughs> Impeccable faith. You see, God doesn't want you to love him for his gifts. God doesn't want you to love him for his blessings. And if you tie your faithfulness to, well, God's, you gave me this, you're not going to make it. We must come to the place where we're in love with the giver, where we're in love with the Lord, where we can say with Job, now I know it's easy. From here, though, not so easy. The Lord gives. The Lord takes. Bless it. 
Job, you hypocrite, you lying devil. You've deceived me all these years, his wife said. Curse God and die. We've lost everything sitting here in the ashes of what once was a great empire. And you're sick with boils all over your body. Where's your God now? Woman, you talk foolishly. Though he slay me. Though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. I don't know where he is. I looked on my left. I looked on my right. I looked all around me. I couldn't find him. But I know my Redeemer liveth. When he's tried me, I will come forth as gold. And I will see him for myself and not another, even when the skin worms devour my body in my flesh. I shall see God. Don't watch the storm. Don't listen to the wind. Contrary voices are not my voice, for I have brought you to this moment in your life to show you my power and my glory. You are mine. You are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, and I will hold you in the hollow of my hand. Do not turn to the right or the left. Let your lights and your eyes look straight on, says the Lord. Hallelujah. My friend, I don't know what you brought in the room today. I don't know, I don't know what's making your, your nerves rattle or your heartache. I don't know what you're going to go home to. But I know heaven has come down right now to do business with you. <laughs> Just slip it down, come find a place, and unburden your heart. Thank you for joining us today for Voice of Triumph. We invite you to check out our website at www.familyworship.org. There you will find information on our church service times, special events, purchase our books and music, and also information on becoming a partner as we continue to take the life-changing message of Jesus Christ to a hurting world. If you'd like to write us concerning our program, our address is The Voice of Triumph, P.O. Box 396, Kings Mountain, 28086, USA. On behalf of Pastor Woodard and the entire Family Worship Center team, God bless you and we'll see you next week.